Well, I'm Marion Cooper, and I'm from Winnipeg, um, Manitoba, which is in Canada, and that's in the center of Canada, uh, just above North Dakota, for those of you who are from the U.S. and can orient yourself there. Um, I'm going to present on a, an initiative that I've been involved with for the last uh, three plus years called Towards Flourishing. So it's certainly not, it doesn't fit within the advocacy screen, uh, stream specifically, but it speaks to innovation and of course with any innovation or project that's being demonstrated to show effects, we want to advocate for those to continue. So I guess in that sense I'm always looking for opportunities to advocate for this work to continue. Um, so I work in a regional health authority in Manitoba and um, I've been involved with um, sort of developing and, and um, um, supporting the, this demonstration project. So I'll just tell you a little bit about it and then um, welcome questions throughout this process as well. So this is a mental health promotion uh, for families initiative. It is a um, research project and there are many people involved. I'm not going to go through the list, but I just want to uh, acknowledge all the people who've been involved in this. I'm one of the co-investigators, along with Jennifer Bowe and Marriott Chartrain, so we're the, sort of the key team. And then there's many, many other people as well. That's just some of those folks. Uh, what I want to do this morning in the short time that we have is just give you a little bit of background around the initiative, um, provide a bit of an overview of what our strategy for mental health promotion of families is all about. I'll highlight some of the research and evaluation methods that we're using over the course of this project and then highlight some uh, results, lessons learned, and some of our hopes for the future with this initiative. So quickly, by way of background, um, this project uh, kind of grew out of some work that was happening within the regional health authority that I work in around perinatal mental health and public health practice. So we have public health nurses who <coughs> see um, all women and families after they've given birth to a baby as a routine part of public health practice. And of course, the number one complication of childbirth is postpartum depression. And so we were doing a lot of capacity building with public health nurses around postpartum depression, and that kind of drew a, and highlighted a real need around broader mental health needs, both in terms of mental health distress and illness, but also how do you promote and protect mental health from a positive perspective. And then the other key partner in all of this is the Healthy Child um, um, organization within Manitoba, which is a provincial organization that takes a whole of government approach to looking at prevention initiatives across the province. And they have a family first home visiting program that they support through reach, regional health authorities. And through the evaluation of our family first program, we were seeing that the home visiting program wasn't making a difference in, term, in terms of maternal depression and other expressions of mental health distress. And so we saw a real gap there. We had a great opportunity with the Public Health Agency of Canada um, put out a call for proposals around innovation strategies for mental health promotion. We were successful in phase one and phase two in terms of getting funding for that. So we went forward and then decided to collaborate and develop innovation. It included many different partners and it's very intersectoral and uh, collaborative. Um, University of Manitoba, Healthy Child Manitoba, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority are the main partners that have come together and then many others that have kind of come together and been a part of this really exciting uh, project. So just to highlight some things there. Um, I'm not going to speak to this. I think the case is well understood in terms of the huge need with families and um, around parental mental illness and maternal depression and other mental health problems. But certainly in Manitoba, um, our experience is the same as what's happening globally. Um, these are some of the statistics that highlight that. We also know that maternal mental health is linked to other um, health-related outcomes, including child development, parent-child interaction, of course, developmental delays, and uh, child abuse and neglect. And so our provincial data was certainly making the case for us to do focus work in this area. We um, started our work with looking at not only uh, d distress and mental illness, but understanding what are the opportunities to promote well-being and mental health. So we've, we adopted very early on the, um, the dual continuum um, model of mental health and mental illness. And I don't know if others are familiar with this, but this is a model that was developed by Corey Keyes, who is a sociologist out of Emory University, and it's really informed a lot of things ha that are happening in Manitoba, but also throughout Canada. 
Um, so it really underpins that you know mental health isn't just the absence of mental illness. We need to be looking at you know how do we support and um, individuals with mental health distress and mental illness, but then also how do we promote positive mental health um, and that you know people who have a diagnosed mental illness um, who are doing well um, also have mental health. But the the, tr the truth to that is that. Somebody who may have mental illness may not be mentally healthy. There may be other practices and supports and resources that they need to kind of enhance their mental health. Just as we know that there are people in our in our communities who may not be diagnosed with a mental illness, but they're not mentally healthy. So it's looking at that dual continuum and the interaction between that. Um, this speaks to mental health promotion and just sort of what we're our goal in this project was really to. Um, to really stretch people's understanding of mental health and to understand mental health and mental illness and to promote positive mental health. So I won't... Our, our, our strategy had three primary goals. We wanted to improve the mental health and decrease mental illness within Family First Home Visiting Program, which is a targeted program for vulnerable families that's delivered by public health. We wanted to upskill and increase the workforce within <coughs> public health and their ability to respond and support families and then increase community capacity around mental health promotion. I'm going to slide through some of this because I know time is um, tight. So here's what our strategy is all about. We have done a lot of work around um, education and supporting workforce development in public health practice. And we've trained two-thirds of our, our uh, public health workforce within Manitoba over the course of the last three years. We've also uh, developed uh, a curriculum that home visitors then use within their practice supporting families, which includes families who are struggling with mental health issues and then just families who are vulnerable or at risk, so that preventative opportunity. And we've got a curriculum and um, a training manual that we've developed as part of that. I'm happy to share that. We've rolled out that training, and then once tr uh, public health nurses and home visitors are trained, they then start working with families uh, with this enhanced sort of lens around mental health and start by doing a real focused screening effort around um, mental health distress and other areas including symptoms of positive <coughs> mental health. We have a new role within the public health team called the Mental Health Promotion Facilitator that supports the public health team to deliver and support families around mental health needs and then that also um, strengthens the link between public health services and mental health services so when families do need supports we can make that connection in a more smooth, collaborative way. So that was our strategy, and those were all the elements of our strategy. And then wrapped within that is a cultural lens, so trying to attend to the broad needs of the population and cultural diversity. This highlights some of our educational materials. We have um, two modules that we've developed that um, home visitors then use with parents to help enhance their skills and practices around taking care of their mental health and addressing their mental health needs. And then we have what we call everyday strategies. So we set out to um, identify simple activities that promote mental health that were scientifically proven, evidence-based, easy to use, had no cost, and could be spread by word of mouth. So anybody could pass it on to a friend. And so uh, that's what we did. And these are the strategies that we had selected. Physical activity, nasal breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, three-minute breathing breaks, and a gratitude, three good things, self-monitoring, social connectedness, belonging, creating a vision, having a sense of purpose and meaning in life, and social connection. So we have worksheets and resources that support the teaching of those skills and strategies. Um, and so again, I have materials I'm happy to share for you to have a look at. Interested. Here's a little sample of some of our materials. So, because home visitors are use a curriculum already in their practice, and uh, this kind of became an additional curriculum that they could use, and then created um, great tools for supporting those conversations. We also, as I said, did, did a screening, and we assessed for mental health and distress, postpartum depression, alcohol use, and also explored parent-child connection and attachment and a few other things. <coughs> that supported our service planning, but also feeds into our research and evaluation of the project. I mentioned that we've done a fair bit of training, so all of our public health staff have re received uh, two plus days of training to be able to operationalize all of this and increase their comfort and confidence to be able to respond to the mental health needs of families in the Family First Program. <coughs> 
and we have also, you know, enhanced our collaboration between services. This speaks to the evaluation element that through the process of the last three years, this has really been based on a <coughs> kind of approach around um, testing out some things with public health, getting their feedback, making adjustments, and then having this whole project and strategy evolve based on the feedback of frontline staff who are using it to be able to kind of really um, get it to a place where we felt that you know it was making a difference and um, really user friendly. So it was very, very much based on a sort of action research approach developmental model. Here's a little bit of a snapshot of our, our strategy, the different elements that I've talked about. So I won't go into that any further, but we do, um, as part of our research, we do survey questionnaires. So each family that's participating in this study would complete five questionnaires. We've also done interviews and focus groups. And then we've done some network mapping. So it has a lot of different methods from a research perspective. And um, really get, gives us a good sense of how it's being received. Any questions so far? I know I'm kind of talking fast and sliding through things. You said earlier in the beginning, if I got it right, you said in the beginning that it, the home visiting part wasn't making as much of a difference as you thought with depression and such. I used, it's, it's, is that related to the curriculum here that you're talking about? No, this was the enhancement we did as a result of hearing that okay. evaluation, okay. that we wanted to be making a difference, so we, we went back and said, okay, what do we need to do differently? So we developed this curriculum. I used to be a prenatal educator home visitor for early in the United States, mm -hmm. and then when I, when I had my child, one of the barriers that I'm facing with these, because I would want the support, but even when I was offered through low income to have a home visitor, I declined it for one, I was afraid that the home visitor would deport me and take my child away. Um, two, I was afraid that the home visitor just wouldn't get me. Well, I had a chronic mental illness. And then when I was at the hospital and I was suffering severely because I got stripped from my medications when I was delivering, the hospital didn't help at all and they just sent me out as I was and then I got put on a wait list for psychiatric care, so just all kind of well, that's really one of the reasons why we want to do this kind of approach, because we want home visitors to be supporting uh, families and not just sort of feeling like they don't know what to do and then they have to report. So it's really building up the skill set of public health nurses and home visitors who are not attached to the child welfare system, who are really there to focus on strengths and build that capacity. <coughs> This is a little bit more about our research. It is a quasi-experimental design, so we're using a step, so step wedge um, uh, research evaluation. Um, here are some of the measures that we're using. So for those of you who are interested in research and evaluation, this um, speaks to some of that. Related to the research, the fact that some parents might lie, I would do questionnaires for parents, and I typically don't have to be a parent realize that most parents were probably you know, the, oh, the parents are being asked if they want to participate in the research, so it's completely voluntary, and they know that they're uh, part of the research to evaluate how useful this is so that it can inform further development. So our hope is, and our experience has been that uh, parents are very engaged and really interested in contributing and wanting, we're just delighted to start to hear people ask about their mental health. It was such a relief to, to them for a public health nurse or a home visitor to actually acknowledge it and to validate it. So we feel that the feedback we're getting is pretty genuine. <coughs> so all of our data, sorry, you get a question? <laughs> yeah, back up a little bit. Sure. Um, what are the qualifications for the home visitors? Um, you know, are they peer parents? Are they, do they have to have a particular degree? You know, what is, because I used to do some uh, home visiting uh, in a family of families, actually, years yeah. ago, and yeah. I suggested to them that they get people from the community, that they hire people living in those neighborhoods, instead of, um, you know, they had all these um, criteria where you they couldn't just hire somebody from a parent from the neighborhood, let's say. Um, well, in this case, the home visitors are people who are, you know, who have lots of parenting experience themselves and can come from sort of a peer perspective, right. or could have, you know, an undergraduate degree and have, you know, work as, you know, in a related area, but it's not, they're not professionally trained, they're paraprofessionals, and we specifically seek them out. Um, you don't actually need to have a lot of training to come into that role, because what we do is we support them 
to um, learn the curriculum that they're going to use and then focus on strengths and how to do that in a way that really aligns with families and parents. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's been really exciting for us in Manitoba, we have the um, great um, data linkage capacity within our province to link the evaluation results of our initiative to other data throughout the province, be it child development data, other health service usage data, school uh, data, justice. Um, so we can actually, over time, as this project continues to unfold, follow up the families that we've been um, involved with through the home visiting program and then see if there's been any you know, positive outcomes um, that uh, follow them along the life course. So that's really exciting. So we'll be linking our data to development through, throughout the childhood experience. So that parent-child connection, so that, that point that was made this morning around parent well-being being so connected to child outcomes is really sort of one of the underpinnings of what we're looking at. Um, so this speaks to sort of the, the repository of data that we're going to be linking to. So just to highlight some of that. The EDI stands for the Early Development Instrument that we do um, universally in Manitoba. Um, and then, of course, um, hospitalization related to maltreatment, injuries, daycare, those kinds of things. Um, our, what we're looking to have is 1,600 families over the course of the study, and we're actually in the last um, half of our study. Uh, the next six months are really critical, and we've had really good uptake, so we're, we're feeling we're on track. And research to date, um, this is what we're, we're learning. Um, we have seen that, um, you know, it is making a difference. We're seeing that uh, women and families are more likely to score high on the postpartum depression with the targeted group that we're working with and the overall population. So that vulnerability is definitely there. That having flourishing mental health, one of the measures that we use, is less than the general population. So not only are they more vulnerable in terms of mental health distress, but they're not um, experiencing symptoms of positive mental health. And of course, women who have flourishing mental health are much less likely to score high on the Edinburgh. So we're seeing that link between sort of distress and, and positive mental health and, and um, the struggles are, are correlating. So those are some of the um, sort of things that we're seeing, lower scores on general distress and alcohol use when you're flourishing. So if we can help, make pe help people be more mentally healthy, that reduces their risk for mental health distress, which is sort of one of our goals. Um, let me just move ahead. So we've been doing a lot of um, qualitative stuff as well, asking public health nurses, asking families, asking parents, how has this experience been and what are the early impacts. So we're hearing a lot of really positive things and um, we are seeing good results. So what we're seeing is that there is definitely an expanded interest and awareness of mental health promotion within public health practice. There's lots more communication and conversation happening between public health, home visitors, and families uh, around mental health as a topic. When we first started this work, public health was very ambivalent about getting involved. Um, they you know, certainly articulated lots of concern about the lack of services available, but when we offered to support and train them, there was you know, some angst because I think you know, there's this um, mystification around mental health in other health services areas. So we really were able to demystify mental health and really give them some opportunity to develop some skills and resources and have tools to really support those conversations in a way that really felt comfortable for them. So their increased confidence has certainly been one of the things we've heard. And um, they have a much better understanding of parents' mental health experience, both from a positive perspective and distress. So here's one example of a, of a quote from a home visitor. So I've gotten to know, you know families that I thought I knew quite well. And I've gotten to know them even better through this new curriculum. So it created this really safe way to have conversation. Um, and they talk a lot about the, the kinds of tools and resources and how, how families have been able to receive them. So like one of my moms who has bipolar, does some things on her own, like does the deep breathing. So really starting to see people internalize these uh, strategies, which has been really positive. So that's one example. 
heard from parents who've been a part of the interviews that they're feeling more relaxed, that they are using those skills, that they are now more aware of the existing resources that are available to them, that they feel more positive, that they're able to, to talk about positive emotions as well as expressions of distress, feeling more independent, accessing services, the ability to focus on their self, because a lot of the curriculum for home visiting is really about how to be a, an effective parent. This kind of created a balance in the conversation mm -hmm. where they had permission and a lot of space to talk about how do they take care of their own well-being and to, to, to have ways to, to do that, and to, to learn some new strategies to do that. And to normalize their own mental health experiences, to reduce the stigma, to create the safety uh, to talk about what they need and to ask for help. And here's another quote. So there's often a lot of fear, and we've certainly heard that, but again, one of the things we've been really delighted about is that this has really created a, a real safe space to, to talk about mental health. Self-care is really integral, and so many of our strategies focus on self-care and uh, increasing awareness about existing supports. One of the things that we've done is some network analysis to be able to map out for public health teams all of the resources that they can um, link families to and create that wraparound system of care. Um, often there's a feeling that if I can't 1-800, you know, referral, and if there's a one place I can call, um, there's, a, there's a, um, a feeling of uh, powerlessness on the part of public health to be able to access services. But through our network analysis, we've been able to really create you know, a broader sense of what are the variety of services and supports that can be involved to support families. <coughs> so I'm just, some of this is focusing on our tools, so I'm just slide ahead. And this is more of the qualitative um, feedback we've gotten from our, our home visitors that just really reiterate the, the value of creating open communication. Our community, uh, our communities are organized in Manitoba uh, based on uh, regional health authorities in large geographic areas. One of the challenges <coughs> in our work has been in some of our rural and northern communities, and the resources are um, are sort of less concentrated and you know have to span a, a large geographic area. So that's been one of the challenges that we've been sort of identifying and we have a mental health promotion facilitator in each of the uh, regional health authorities and one of the things that we're learning is that, you know, how do, how do you, def how do you, you can't geographically commute to many of the places where the services are being delivered, uh, so in one EFP uh, we then have to cut it up into different pieces, uh, which is a, one of our challenges. So that's one of the things we're going to have to figure out as we move forward. So context really matters. We, we know that public health system and parents in the postpartum period really creates this fantastic opportunity for us to really reach families and parents early on through that universal experience of giving birth and becoming a parent and that focusing on mental health at that time makes a lot of sense. Um, that when we rolled this out provincially, there were new challenges across our, our province um, in the urban setting, in the rural, south, northern RHAs, that's the regional health authorities, and we have to keep figuring out how do we support in a better way our northern G and our remote communities. Um, the other important thing that really has been a huge learning here is that partnerships between public health and mental health, there's a lot of work to continue to build those uh, connections between those two service delivery systems. We have um, translated all of our resources into six different languages and we've done a lot of work around cultural uh, adaptation, so that's a big theme for us in our work. And we focus on First Nations, Aboriginal, Newcomer, and Francophone, so that's been um, something that's been built into all of our program development and, and uh, resource development, ensuring some real clinical and uh, cultural relevance. We did that through a lot of consultations and learnings from First Nations communities and also uh, newcomer and francophone communities. 
and fathers. I mean, often our public health nurses are seeing moms postpartum um, <coughs> delivery, but we've been working with fathers a lot too. And what are their unique needs around uh, their mental health and well-being and supporting the family? So that's been a really important learning for us. So here are some of the other things that we've learned about the, the value of augmenting existing programs. Uh, we didn't, we, we augmented an existing program, so the <coughs> impact on um, how much resource was required kind of kept it really feasible. Um, we learned that this was really acceptable and useful to parents, home visitors, and public health. The timing of its delivery and the readiness of public health was great and aligned. <coughs> and it really filled a gap in practice. Um, so all of these things, I think, have really contributed to our overall sense of effectiveness and success so far. Um, over the next six months, we're going to be looking at all of our data to see what the, the, the outcomes are with families as well. Um, so we're really excited to see how that kind of um, takes hold. Um, I'm going to just quickly zip over and just talk a little bit about cost-benefit. If we were going to continue this, right now we have a grant from Public Health Agency of Canada that's allowing us to do this work. But we're really doing a lot of advocacy with our governments and different levels of uh, government around um, uh, sustainability. This, if this program would cost $37 per child um, to sustain on an ongoing basis. So that's a pretty low cost when you think about the outcomes that it can deliver. So that's one of our uh, key objectives over the next six months is to look at sustainability. But we did do a cost-benefit analysis and that I think is uh, a useful way to move something like this forward. And I think that's it. Any other questions? That was a pretty quick uh, run through. We have a website. We do actually have a website. And I can put that on here, but I can give that to you after. Um, where are you at? So, like, one reason that I want to go to this is um, I was in Home Visitor and it starts in Oregon, the United States. And we, they do not have this right now. I mean, federally, it has not a problem. They don't have anything really within the curriculum of what they use. Where are you at in this potentially being transposable over, like, if I were to contact you and say, how is, can this come over here to Oregon and be offered to this um, child care facility use? Are you guys there yet, or? You know, I think we, we would be there in probably about six months mm -hmm. um, because we're going to be finishing up our evaluation and then we can really say, you know, this is what the you know the outcomes are, um, and with confidence say you know this is a worthwhile investment. You know we certainly are seeing lots of promising results that suggest that. Um, but one of our goals is to sustain this in our province, but the, then to look at scaling up. So looking at you know if it is working, if it's you know relatively low cost, how do other home visiting programs take something like this on? And the materials are there. We're happy to share them, and we'll we'll just get it out there because. You know, this was never intended to be something that just happens in an isolated way. We want to try something, learn from it. If it works, then get it out there because you know we want to make a difference. So I know all my time's up. No, no, no. You go. This is question time. Oh, okay. It's Sorry. Good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you have any indications from the Manitoba government that they're interested in keeping it going. Yeah, we have. We do have indications, but like I'm sure in most places, there's lots of. Um, financial um, constraints these days. You know, certainly in our province we're hearing more about, you know, it's, you know, there not being a lot of new funding. But we've heard and it's been sort of looked at from a costing perspective that they're interested in looking at this and it's being put forward um, as something to continue to support. So we feel pretty hopeful, but, you know, we don't know until it really happens, right? And of course, once the final results are in, that will really give us even more sort of ammunition to support moving forward in making the case for this ongoing investment. It's time for more questions. Well, I think it's a beautiful project and really uh, nicely explained. A couple of things struck me about it. Uh, well, one, and I might not have been listening well enough, can you please just clarify who was the target population initially? Yeah. That's one thing I was wondering about. Yeah. So, the, um, so just to explain our Family First Home Visiting Program, which is a provincial program, <coughs> that yeah. program um, is targeting vulnerable families. So what happens, a public health nurse will go out and visit all moms and families who have just given birth. And then as part of that, that uh, visit, they do a screening tool, 
which is screening for vulnerability for child maltreatment or you know, parenting struggles. And so it's not intended to be you know, a, a stigmatizing thing, just to highlight what might be some of the needs and challenges, but then offer some additional supports. That program was put in the public health program because we didn't want that the parents to feel like it was about you know identifying you know families who are struggling so that child welfare could get involved. We wanted to be very neutral and straight based. So it is targeting vulnerable families who may be struggling with mental health issues, uh, substance use, or have had a history of struggle, um, poverty, um, those kinds of things that just put a lot of stress on a family. So it's very broad and it's very much based on prevention and supporting family families to, to flourish. Uh, so because the home visiting program is targeted in that sense, vulnerable families, we wanted this program, this um, uh, enhancement, to really serve all of those families. But we see it being a value universally. So every parent who gets a public health visit would benefit from this strategy because everybody has mental health needs, not just those that are vulnerable or at risk, right? It's really a universal kind of approach. But for this study, it is um, for the Family First Home Building Program and those at risk families. The other point I thought was really interesting were those uh, six to ten strategies that you yeah. came up with, which are like you said, very simple things, but they're all evidence-informed. Yeah, yeah, they, they're, um, they all have evidence. And we selected strategies based on very specific criteria, the criteria I mentioned. It didn't need to cost anything, could be spread by word of mouth, it is evidence-informed, and it's to the smallest sort of distilled sort of level of evidence. You know, so nasal breathing, you know, there's lots of evidence about that, or physical activity, or social supports, you know. Um, so those things that are really easy for all of us to grapple with and understand, but struggle to do. You know, all of us struggle to do all of those things probably at different points in our, in our life. So this is a way to kind of really help people cultivate those practices and, and use them in their everyday life. So is this uh, program mandatory for the target recipients or you have something to attract them to engage in this program? Are all of our home visitors and public health nurses offer it? And it's, it's offered to, to them in a really, um, you know, attractive way. Mm -hmm. So it is voluntary, though. And so, but we've had really good uptake. Mm -hmm. And because it's presented in a really attractive kind of way that's, you know, you know, pleasant, and they can see the connection, you know, if I work on this skill, so I can be a, you know, healthier parent, but I also <coughs> teach my kid that same skill. Like, I teach my kids, you know, or my one kid, nasal breathing. Know, when he's <laughs> struggling with something. So he, that's the whole uh, idea of cascading. So what you can teach, you can pass on to other people, your spouse, your kid, that kind of thing.